In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Amen. Starting this past Monday, we saw a shift in the lectionary readings prescribed to us by the church. Following the great feast of Pentecost, the vast majority of the lectionary consisted of readings according to the Gospel of Matthew, followed by several days where St. Mark's Gospel was consulted for the feast day of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. Today is the first Sunday of Luke, and thus we heard the first gospel lesson prescribed for a Sunday from this evangelist's great work. Indeed, we will continue to read and hear St. Luke's gospel proclaimed to us daily, well into the new year, into the next several months, until we're all into the new year leading up to St. Basil's feast day, and even prior to the nativity of Christ, where we'll switch a little bit into the Gospel of St. Matthew again. The first words of, the, of chapter three in the book of Ecclesiastes reads, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. If this sounds familiar, I'd like to point out that believe it or not, these words were first written down in scripture prior to the song, Turn, 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 popularized by the birds in 1965. Of course, the church is no exception to the rule that every season has a purpose and a time in which certain themes are highlighted for our consideration. I highlight this verse in Ecclesiastes because I would like us all to understand where we all find ourselves in the ecclesiastical calendar as of this morning. It is interesting to note that as of this week, we find ourselves at a crossroad between two liturgical seasons. First, let's briefly recall the major theme from last week's gospel lesson taken from Mark. The Lord said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Here it goes without saying that we heard this because last Sunday was a day that followed the feast day of the exaltation of the Holy Cross. And the church in her wisdom wanted us to remember what we learned the week prior about our own crosses and embed that lesson in our hearts and our minds. Second, in today's epistle reading, we heard St. Paul's words to Timothy. Timothy, my son, you have observed my persecutions, my sufferings, what befell me in Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. We know that from the book of Acts, St. Paul endured many hardships in his ministry. Just in the example cited in this passage, we know that in Antioch, he was rejected and expelled from the city by the Jews who didn't want him preaching in their city. In Iconium, Paul narrowly escaped being physically assaulted in an attempt to stone him. Lastly, in Lystra, Paul was actually stoned and injured so badly that he was left for dead outside of the city walls. Despite all of these hardships dealt to Paul, which Timothy witnessed firsthand, the Lord delivered him. Paul doesn't bring up these struggles that he had faced to brag to Timothy, but rather that he may understand that with God's help, they were overcome. Paul, as Timothy's mentor, is encouraging him to endure the temptation to give up on the challenges he is facing in his ministry to the Gentiles. In other words, Paul is encouraging Timothy to carry his cross in the faith that God will grant him the endurance to carry on despite the challenges that he is facing. Paul doesn't attempt to sugarcoat the truth. Indeed, he tells Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ, Jesus, will be persecuted. With these words, St. Paul extols Timothy to prepare himself to endure his cross, but not to fear because Christ is there carrying his cross alongside him. Furthermore, St. Paul is also highlighting the qualities that distinguish a disciple of Christ from others. These are the qualities of teaching, appropriate conduct, 
noble goals in this life. Faith, patience, love, steadfastness, and a familiarity with the divine scripture. These qualities St. Paul strives for and he challenges all Christians, us and Timothy, to do likewise. Finally, we come to today's gospel reading where St. Luke recalls Christ calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his full-time disciples. On the surface, it may appear that this gospel lesson is chosen to highlight the first days of Christ's ministry, as we are told that he preached to a crowd that was pressing up against him on the shores of Lake Gennesaret. Perhaps it may seem that this is a story about Christ's great miracle, which blessed Peter with an abundance of fish, so great that he indeed needed the assistance of his brother Andrew, James, and John to help him haul the catch back to shore from the deep waters. With the liturgical season that we now find ourselves in, I would argue that neither of these are the points that the church wants us to take away from this lesson. Rather, the theme which is highlighted in the last verses of Christ calling his disciples to embrace a life following him is what we're meant to take away. Up to this point, Peter, Andrew, James, and John were surely familiar with Christ. Learning from and spending time with him, but they still kept their day jobs as fishermen and worked to support their families. In other words, leading up to this event that is described to us today, they interacted with Christ as students and less so as his disciples. It was only after the great miracle of pulling in that enormous catch of fish that they were prepared to take on full-time roles as Christ's disciples. Indeed, Christ still expected them to learn and to be his students, but he called them now to take the next steps and embrace longer and permanent discipleship. This is a role that required them to abandon their livelihoods, leave their families for a time, and follow him on his travels and be an active part of his ministry. At this point, I would like us to pause and imagine being in the shoes of these four men who were not only being challenged to leave their families and everything they knew, but also take up a totally, totally radical way of life that was unfamiliar to them. If this was asked of any of us, who wouldn't respond reluctantly? with concerns about leaving their comfortable lifestyle. We would wonder how our families would be provided for fi financially and how they would cope without us. There's no doubt these are exactly the same concerns that Peter, Andrew, James, and John had the moment that Christ posed this challenge to them. Prior to the miracle they, that they witnessed, it's safe to say that they would politely if not sternly deny this invitation to partake in Christ's ministry, perhaps as we would today. It was only after a fruitless night of hard work and at the good teacher's instruction that they had barely drawn their nets because of the abundance of fish and brought their catch to the shore, did Peter exclaim to the Lord, no doubt speaking also for the other three, on his knees, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Observe that in these words, Peter wasn't denying Christ's invitation because he was worried about earthly things. Rather, his concern is a result of his own unworthiness to be a witness and a co-worker in Christ's ministry. And what is Christ's response to Peter's insecurity? Do not be afraid. Set your mind at ease, Christ tells him. Because from here on out, you're no longer going to be catching fish. You are rather going to be working for me and catching men by means of the gospel. No longer will Peter 
nor Andrew, James, or John, be catching fish for pennies and struggle to support their families. Now, they will rather be an active and full-time member in Christ's life-giving ministry and make a living off the treasure of his good news. Whether this was a job offer that they were expecting or hoping for, we don't know. We do know that they accepted Christ's invitation with joy and commitment. Because when they heard the offer, we know they immediately brought their boats in to the shore and left everything to follow Christ. Here, I would like to point out one thing. The fact that the disciples only committed to regular participation in Christ's ministry after witnessing one single miracle. The question I ask myself frequently, and I hope you all would consider, is what is my excuse for not joyfully accepting Christ's invitation? Very much like the four men we've been discussing, all of us certainly have commitments to our work, our communities, and our families. There is nothing wrong with taking these commitments seriously and fulfilling our obligations to them with a sense of joy and pride. The difference between them and us, however, is that it only took them one miracle to follow Christ in discipleship. How many miracles do we witness every single day and we still do not heed the Lord's call to follow him seriously? How often do each of us witness the descent of the Holy Spirit on simple bread and wine, turning it into something that gives us life in the form of the Eucharist? How many ordinations, baptisms, chrismations, weddings do we witness in our lifetimes? And see how frequently the Holy Spirit is present and transfigures those, transfigures those human beings into something greater than what they were prior. In our own families, how many times have each of us been a part of the miracle of life, both in the form of being brought into the world and in the form of a sick loved one being healed from an infirmity, thanks to modern medicine. In these regards, I argue that we witness far greater miracles than the disciples saw in their ministries and in following Christ. It is here at this crossroad of the liturgical season that we are ending and just beginning that I hope we can reflect on where each of us stands and finds ourselves in our relationship to, with Christ and take, up, take him up on his invitation to follow him in all seriousness. Let us take the time as we proceed in this season to continue to reflect on the realities of the Holy Cross and the message given to us that if we are truly worthy of Christ, we all have to carry our own crosses to follow him with joy and denial of ourselves. Let us remember, likewise, St. Paul's message to Timothy to endure the challenges we face with courage, endurance, and faith of what we know is true in order that we may embrace the qualities of discipleship that each of us is called to maintain. Lastly, we need to constantly keep Christ's words, do not be afraid, in our minds and in our hearts. As we begin and continue on the path that he has placed us on, to be his disciples. He didn't say to Peter that he wouldn't experience challenges in, the, in following him in his ministry. Rather, Christ assured him that all he needs to do is pick up his own cross and everything else will be provided to him. Let us all likewise keep these words in mind and be comforted that once we take those steps of carrying our own cross and accept Christ's invitation to join him joyfully, and with endurance, that we will also have nothing to fear as we continue side by side along him and along his path.